also in this, so, so this drug has not been used in many people at all with IVF. And so um, they are still trying to tweak and look at dosage, dosage with that. So they've got two different doses of the investigational agent to kind of see which one is going to work better. And they're pretty different, I don't remember exactly, but they're pretty different doses. Um, and they also want to really see what are the side effects going to be. So this trial is kind of a little bit of like a phase one, phase two, but they're calling it a phase three. They got approval from the FDA to do this as a phase three trial. Um, biggest concern that um, we have about this is the potential for liver toxicity with this drug. And so um, we'll see what happens with it. You know, it's one of these that it could really make a difference for people, but it could also do harm. And so we're just gonna see, you know, how it goes over over time. There are so there's the Isabella one and the Isabella two <coughs> trial. They're they're identical trials, but the FDA wants to make sure that the results are real. And so they're actually rolling under two different identical trials, 750 people in each. So that's your large phase three study for people. Um, and for this, because it is a very uh, large time commitment, um, we are going to have some compensation provided for time and travel. And then if people have, you know, issues with transportation, they'll let you, you know, get a taxi or an Uber. If you need, you know, travel from, a, you know, long distance, you need a hotel. They'll provide hotel accommodations, and those are, you know, little things that can go a long way for people. Um, oh, and yes, I didn't mention, so right, so the thought is autotaxin um, is higher in people with IPF, so the, this drug they're hoping is going to target that and decrease the level of autotaxin to help slow that progression. Next, we have pulmonary rehabilitation study. This is also people with IPF. And so this is a phase four study. <coughs> So it's specifically for people who are on OFEF and who um, will be randomized either to standard of care alone or standard of care plus pulmonary rehab. And people can go to the pulmonary rehab at um, you know, their local rehab facility. They don't have to come to Charlottesville for that. So it's 26 weeks, so half a year basically, um, seven study visits um, to, the, to the site. Um, you know, we're going to have a CT scan if one hasn't been, you know, done within the past 24 months. And again, with a lot of these industry trials, they provide compensation for more time um, because they are asking, they're asking you to give up, you know, half a day plus to come to these study visits. Next, we have the scenic trial, another IPF trial. This one is literally like just in my to-do list for what's called study startup, and that is like, best way to describe study startup is mountains, and I mean mountains of paperwork and hundreds of hours to get a study actually open to a moment. So, although they would like for us to be open July the 29th, I can tell you that this study will not be open probably for six months. Uh, they, they get very ambitious and excited, you know, you know forget about like, all of the people and everything that comes into play. Um, so this one is for people who have chronic cough. So they're going to have people wear this cough monitor and um, have to have, to have like an average of 10 coughs per hour in order to be in the study. And so it's there's two parts. Um, so again, they're having lots of different doses of the medication that they're giving people. And um, a study visits over 28 weeks. So you know, a bit of time involved with that one as well. And then we are now moving on to Dr. Shim's studies, which will apply to several of you in here. Um, so this first study is um, an NIH study, and he is looking at people who have had lung transplant at UVA. Um, so he focuses on this hyperpolarized gas imaging, which is pretty, so they use this noble gas called xenon-129. And so 
people who are in his studies are typically going to be having one or more of these hyperpolarized gas MRIs. And so it's, it's essentially a contrast agent that we're using, and it lights up the lungs. And so it shows them where air is not flowing in and out the way that it's supposed to be. And so with, with people who've had lung transplants, virtually everyone is going to have some form of lung rejection within five years. And they don't really understand exactly what's going on with that. They have people coming in all the time having these bronchoscopies, lung function testing. It is, has anybody in here had a lung transplant? No, so it is really, really time intensive. And um, so what Dr. Shim is hoping is that this hyperpolarized gas imaging is actually going to help him identify who is moving towards lung rejection in a much faster manner. Well, not much faster, but learn more quickly. So if you know, okay, somebody looks like they're about to have some rejection issues, then maybe they can identify what medication to give people and give it to people earlier, thereby it would be awesome to then prevent that rejection from happening. And so this is truly for like anyone who's had a lung transplant, no matter what the, uh, what the issue has been. And he's got the two parts. So the first is like surveillance, um, you know, collecting information from people and taking samples, of course. And then part two is the lung MRI piece. But I would imagine people would actually want to do that. Um, and that is at his facility over at Talk to you with MRIs. Yes, ma'am. How does this gas imaging work? So I'm, I'm there. I've had a lung transplant. Can you walk me through what happens? So it's just like a regular MRI. So you go into the MRI machine, and we get these little bags. They're about this big. And so basically, we look at, I think the gas is like one third. You know, have you heard of FVC, your forced vital capacity? When you do your PFTs, when you do your spirometry, they're looking at what your, your forced vital capacity is. And then they, they cut that. It's either one third or two thirds of that they'll actually polarize this gas. And then you are going to literally like inhale the gas. So you like breathe it in, and then you just have to hold your breath for anywhere from like five to 10 seconds, and then they take all the images. And usually you'll get like multiple bags of the gas, but I mean, it's, it's very transient. So like some people, like side effects from the Xenon 129 euphoria, some people's voices will drop really, really low. Um, some people will have just, you know, a little bit of dizziness. Um, some people complain of headache. By and large, people tolerate it really well. It's been used in hundreds of people now. And that's something that um, both UVA and Duke are specializing in. Um, they're actually doing, I didn't put those studies on here because they're going to be um, ending relatively soon. And it's for lung transplant and lung reception, and I thought, you know, unless somebody's about to have a lung transplant or a lung, lung resection, but they're hoping that um, they're going to be able to get this FDA approved um, because they're thinking that this non-129 gas is superior to the standard of care, which is uh, non-133 gas that they have to use. So yeah, there's really no pain involved with it. Um, sometimes it takes a little while um, to do these, but um, I. I love these studies because I really feel like he's going to discover um, things that are going to benefit people. And then we have um, his, um, this is his, what we call it his R01, so it's basically a large grant from the NIH that he has. So this is for people with COPD. He does need a lot of people for this. Um, and he's looking at two FDA-approved drugs, which some of you may be on or have been on in the past, Anoro and Arnuity. And so you come for, for five different study visits, and you're going to have these serial MRIs. So he wants to look at kind of where you are at baseline, what your lungs look like at baseline. Then he's going to give you, I think it's our Anoro first. You're going to be on that, I think, for you know eight weeks, something like that, six or eight weeks you're on mm -hmm. Anoro and then come back in, get re-imaged, then have a little siesta, then switch over to our annuity. And so he just wants to look over time to see, hey, are there differences between baseline and our Noro 
talked about Noro and our annuity. Um, so you get the drugs free of charge while you're in the research study. Um, and it's pretty quick. It's 90 days. And his visits, like I said, they're all at Fontaine Research Park, which is it's actually uh, more convenient than coming to the main hospital because you just park and go in. And so um, Rose Love, um, the coordinator, she does that trial. Um, she's a respiratory therapist, and so she is really, really good with that population. And so that's all I've got right now. Does anybody have questions for me? Yes? How do you, or who do you contact find out about getting involved in any of these trials? So in the back, I have my business card. Um, for research, if you want to learn more about research, call me, my number's on that card. And if it's something that um, is with Dr. Shin's group, I can get you in touch with Rose Love. Um, but yeah, I'm pretty much your point of contact. Um, I also forgot to mention, um, we are having an educational day on October 19th. Um, we think it's going to be, well, it's going to be at one of the local hotels in Charlottesville. It's on a Saturday, and our ILD doctors will all be there. We are looking to have a guest speaker, and so I do have flyers um, in the back, you know, if you all are interested in attending an um, educational day with physicians, you can really answer your questions. Yes? Can you wait for us to get a copy of chart? Sure. Yes, absolutely. If you send them to Dawn, Dawn uh -huh. can make them available to everybody. Okay, great. <coughs> yes, definitely do that. <coughs> How do you find out um, the qualifications for being, because I'm not with the UVA, but I have expressed interest in, in studies for COP before, but I'm always kind of qualified. Okay. And so, there just seems to be a lot of it. And I do want to ask one to do it. I think that for, I want to make medications. So I think they were looking for people with less severe asthma. And I just... Yeah, and so eligibility, I should have really talked about that in my talk. Um, right, with clinical trials, they are typically looking at real specific groups. Because again, if, if you have people with a lot of different medical conditions or people who are on a lot of medications, it can A, kind of muddy the water for you know testing their hypothesis, you know, or, or being able to analyze the data. And it's also, even more importantly, a safety issue sometimes. So if people are not um, quite as, as healthy, then their fear is that, like, you know, for example, with that Isabella trial, you know, they're really, really looking closely, and it's like if you have, you know, moderate liver disease, you can't even be in the study. Um, so each one, if you contact like, the, the clinical research coordinator, which is like me, um, we are looking at the eligibility criteria, we know the criteria, and we can tell you like over the phone, yeah. yes, you're going to qualify. Yeah, for usually this, it's you know. something over the phone. Someone calls you and they have a better questions. Yeah. And they look at that preliminary yeah. criteria. To Most know. of the COPD studies are the people that were smokers. And I have been diagnosed with asthma and COPD, but I was never smoking. So usually with the COPD ones, they always want someone who's smoked in the past. So what's it called? It's a genetic variant. It's, what is it called? It's <coughs> alpha A, something like alpha trypsin 1. Yes, I don't have that either. You don't have that? No. But no, I will tell you, his study does not require that. Because I know he's enrolling people with that. But I can't remember actually. You said that Dr. Shim? Dr. Shim. Mm -hmm.